Aha! I wrote this line. I was coming into this very cocky, and now I'm faced with, do you take me for a basic bitch? <laughs> ah, this is nice. My taint remains unchanged, which is <laughs> it's a, a line from uh, resident alien, Harry Vanderspiegel. I wrote this line. <laughs> my taint remains unchanged. I have such pride that I wrote a line, my taint remains unchanged. My mom will be happy to know that my mind's in the gutter. Will there be a season four? I do not know. We work for sci-fi and they are not a typical network. I'm pretty sure they're a front for meth, crystal meth. And we're just, you know, we're just sort of the window dressing. So it depends on how meth sales are going. So, fingers crossed. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Here we go. There were a lot of explosions for two people blending in. So I can almost say it in the character voice because he has, he has an accent. There were a lot of explosions for two people blending in. This is a robot. This is K2SO from Rogue One. There are a lot of explosions for two people blending in. Freeze, right there. If you're a motion capture character like I was in Rogue One, one of the biggest challenges, getting your food. The guys at catering just see you as an extra. And so they have to know you and that you're a character in the, in the movie. And so I'd say that's the biggest challenge, making connection with catering and letting them know, hey, I'm gonna be here a lot. Don't, don't treat me poorly, don't spit. Not that they spit in the food of the extras, they spit in the food of the extras, but that's mainly it. Technically, I was never alive, but I appreciate your concern. Sounds again like a robot. I start saying it like the character. Technically, I was never alive, but I appreciate your concern. I'm gonna guess this was Sonny from iRobot. Technically, I was never alive, but I appreciate your concern. I went to Juilliard, which at the time that I went, they were very cookie cutter in their approach to acting. Like everybody got the same stamp and the same education and you were taught to speak in a certain way and walk and talk in a certain way. And it was not far from robotic. Uh, it, was a, it, it was a criticism at the time. Not now, but back then. And so it really works well to have that sort of in your back pocket. There we go. Ooh. Ooh. I was coming into this very cocky and now I'm faced with, do you take me for a basic bitch? I evidently said this and I remember it so weird, well, weirdly well. Do you take me for a basic bitch? Harry Vanderspiegel from uh, Resident Alien? I guess it's gonna be suburgatory. No, sounds like Emily, Emily Katnick's writing. Oh, Harley Quinn. Okay, yes. Do you take me for a basic bitch? Ah, uh, yeah, that sounds like something Joker would say. You take me for a basic bitch. My approach was the Joker was created by an acid bath. And if I eat spicy foods, then I get acid reflux and, and it aggravates my voice. So I've started with a voice that has been completely washed in acid. And that was how it began. And then it sort of because he's the Joker. <laughs> it just kind of came from, went from there. I have a basic knowledge of, basic bitch knowledge of the Joker from mainly the live action movies, Heath Ledger, Jack Nicholson, and some comics. I never saw any of Mark Hamill's stuff except I knew he was the best. When I went in to do my first recording for the Joker, Tony Hale was there. He voices Brainiac. And I think he heard me doing Clayface and I came out of the booth and Tony goes, hey, oh, hey, by the way, who did we get to play the Joker? It has to be Mark Hamill. Nobody else will be good enough. <laughs> I said, Tony, it's me. You can't, what are you saying? He's like, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I did the Joker once. And everybody said, unless it's Mark Hamill, it's not good enough. Bump. You hit a guy, aha! I know this one. I can say this one in the character. 
And it's like this. You hit a guy with glasses. <laughs> it's well played. <laughs> That's King Candy from Wreck-It Ralph. <laughs> you hit a guy with glasses. That's, that's well played. This was the first time I worked for Disney. Someone was supposed to do the reading, another actor. And they fell out, something happened. And my agent said, hey, I got another actor over here named Alan Tudyk, and he can do it. And they said, can he do an Edwin accent? Edwin was a vaudevillian actor who did Mary Poppins and did Mad Hatter. And she said, Alan is so good at that accent. And they said, okay, we'll fly him up to Pixar in San Francisco with the whole cast, really. She called me and said, can you please tell me you can do this accent? Because she had just promised it before she knew. But I, I could. I loved Edwin. And then I went up and did it. And then John Lasseter said, hey, it's really nice to meet you. And then I've been in every one since. <laughs> oh, you dirty rat. Why are you helping her? She's a cop. This is uh, Duke Weaselton. Yes, Duke. He's in um, uh, Zootopia, another one of the Disney movies. You dirty rat, why are you helping her? She's a cop. Everybody loves animals. Who knows them? Maybe that's not true. Farmers eat them a lot. But it was a good story, you know? Okay. You, is there sorcery in you too? Are you a monster too? I'm guessing he sounded something like that. This was a character, Duke uh, Wesselton, not Weaseltown, for Frozen. Is there sorcery in you too? Are you a monster too? He was one that came with a drawing that I showed up on the day and they're like, what do you got for this old dude? And so we started off like this and then it sort of became this person once he, once he became so persnickety about we Wesselton, Wesselton, then he, that kind of came out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mammoths. Mammoths never travel alone. Mammoths never travel alone. So this is Ice Age. This would probably be the big saber-toothed tiger. Mammoths never travel alone or some kind of... Whatever my... The deepest I could make my voice in 1999, 1998. Mammoths never travel alone. Mammoths never travel alone. My first job in voiceover was for Ice Age, and they just handed me a stack of photos this big, or drawings that big, and I just went through and did a voice for everyone. There was like a voice, and they had two lines, and voice and two lines, and voice and two lines. Then they called me and said, you got three roles. And I went back and did, and one was a, a he was a saber-toothed tiger who was big. It was kind of, a, I didn't like the voice, but they liked it. And then I was some, it was called a goofy dinosaur. Why do you think they call it the Ice Age? Which I think that sounds like some old Warner Brothers cartoon that I just was tucked in my head somewhere. And then there was another one. Oh, oh, I was the, the, women, prepare for the Ice Age. All the little dodo birds, the last melon. And they, you could keep their, the tongues were lolling around in their mouths. So that became just a lateral lisp. So the drawing, if it has a tongue up there, um, I'm using that as a way of figuring out where their, <laughs> where their consonants are placed. Okay. Ah, we will rule over this land and we will call it this land. That is from Firefly, character of Wash. We will rule over all this land and we will call it this land. It was the first season, and it was the first episode. It was the pilot episode. This was my audition. It's part of my audition piece. This show changed my life. It truly changed my life. This opened up the world of science fiction conventions, and I went to my first one the year after we had finished, before we made the movie, in London. I went to one in London. And it was such an impactful thing for me. And it was back at a time when Comic-Cons weren't big, Comic-Cons weren't accepted. It was so impactful. I ended up making a show about cons. I made a little uh, show for a streaming channel that lasted for a short amount of time called Con Man. It was all about cons. So it made a huge difference. Okay. It's... <laughs> Betray us and I will fong you until your insides are out. Your outsides are in and your entrails will become your extrails. 
That goofiness was me. The entrails, extrails, Lotzi. This is Watt from A Knight's Tale. Betray us, and I will fong you until your insides are out. Your outsides are in, your entrails will become your extrails. I've got a great picture of me kissing him. It was in the rehearsal and I had a camera and this is before selfies and stuff, but Heath was a really good photographer. When I kissed him, he just did this and he's looking right, he's just like looking right at the camera with a little smile on his face. And I'm, I'm going away ready to spit because that's what the scene was. And it's this great picture because he took it and it's, uh, it's just a beautiful moment. It was great. He was a good guy. He was really, really sweet guy. All right. Okay. That one didn't do much. Okay, here we go. I was doing her in Amy's mom's room. I was doing her in Amy's mom's room. Oh, this doesn't sound like a Disney film. I don't know. Oh no, was it uh, 35 miles from normal? I was doing her in Amy's mom's room. Oh, let's not talk about that film. <laughs> you know who wrote that film? Yeah, let's really not talk about You know who wrote that film was the guy who got canceled over his extracurricular activities on One Tree Hill. I was always extra and uh, I really liked mimicking things I saw on television and, and in cartoons probably as well. I was a class clown and my mother put me in the Plano Community Theater's production of Fabulous Fable Factory at the mall. We performed at the mall, two performances only. And then in my senior year, my teacher, I wasn't gonna continue to be an actor because I didn't want to be poor. And my teacher said, no, you, you will make it. And you convinced me to be an actor. Like one afternoon between her and my, my friend, Jimmy, who, was a dancer. I remember we went out for coffee one morning before school, smoke cigarettes, drink coffee. And he said, I'm not gonna be a psychologist, I'm gonna be a dancer. And then it was like right there with my teacher telling me, you can do it. And that was it, I never looked.